its casing opened. The springs snapped, and the nose cone was pushed out of the way. A ball with four antennae emerged to go it alone in the darkness of space. The Cold War saw some great advancements in technology and science. The Soviet Union especially became great pioneers in space exploration, with the launch of the first ever satellites and cosmonauts into space. This was then followed by the United States trying to compete with the USSR and achieving some pioneering feats themselves, such as landing the first person on the moon. But alongside being a period of history that entailed some great scientific and technological achievements, the Cold War, which was perpetuated by the Western capitalist bloc against the socialist camp of nations, was also a pretty dangerous and scary time for the people of both the capitalist and the socialist bloc of countries. Now let's imagine, for argument's sake, that you are living your life with a gun pointed to your head. At the same time, you are also armed with a gun and you're pressing this weapon against your opponent's head. The catch is that if even one of you was to pull the trigger, it would just result in the inevitable deaths of both of you. It sounds a bit mad when you think about it initially, but in reality, and I, I don't want to put it lightly either, if you are under the age of 80, you have been unwittingly living your entire life with a gun pointed at your head. This is what's called mutually assured destruction. It was a military strategy which was brought about during the Cold War, when tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union were reaching breaking point. Nuclear explosions are caused by weapons such as H-bombs or atom bombs. They are like ordinary explosions, only many times more powerful. They cause great heat and blast. They also make a cloud of deadly dust, which falls slowly to the ground. This is what is called fallout. The time has now come to make everything ready for you and your family in case an air attack happens, and we must all be prepared for it. So don't waste time. To help you, we will remind you once again about choosing a fallout room and an inner refuge. If attack is imminent, you will hear the attack sound like this. If anyone dies while you are kept in your fallout room, move the body to another room in the house. Label the body with name and address and cover it as tightly as possible in polythene, paper, sheets or blankets. Being a socialist state that handed support to plenty of other socialist and anti-colonial national liberation movements all over the world, the Soviet Union became a great big barrier to the capitalist classes of the Western imperialist countries. This was why there was always the mentality of preparing for war against the socialist bloc, especially in the United States, who had actually entered the age of nuclear weapons immediately after World War II when they dropped two atomic bombs onto Japan in 1945. This is what forced the socialist countries, particularly the Soviet Union and its Warsaw Pact allies, into the arms race, as they really just couldn't let what happened in Japan happen to them too. Whenever a discussion about nuclear weapons takes place, it's vital that these two atomic bombs that the US dropped onto Japan get brought up. The reason for this is because those two events gave us a pretty horrific taster of the destructive capabilities of nuclear weapons. Though Western pop culture during the Cold War consistently portrayed the Soviet Union as the big scary warlords who were armed to the teeth with nukes, the reality is that the only nation that has actually dropped a nuclear bomb onto real civilians is the United States. Despite the common narrative that the Japanese were pushed to surrender by the atomic bombs being dropped onto Hiroshima and Nagasaki, there has actually been plenty of discussions over the decades following the end of the Second World War of whether or not it was actually necessary to use these bombs in the first place, the consequences of which these two Japanese cities still suffer from to this day. A lot of historians have been going through documents that were released by the Japanese government at this time and discover that there is actually 
actually a very strong possibility that Japan may not have surrendered because of the nuclear weapons at all, but particularly because of the crushing defeat that the Japanese forces endured in Manchuria by the Red Army. What then followed the Soviet victory in Manchuria was a plan by the USSR to launch another offensive and invade Hokkaido, and with the military and industrial might of both the United States and the Soviet Union coming their way, Japan would have definitely been crushed almost immediately, especially given the state that the Japanese Empire was in when by 1945 it was retreating on all fronts from the Allies. So the atomic bombs being dropped onto Japan by the US were not so much a way to push Japan to surrender. Instead, the atomic bomb was just a way for the US to show off its military might to try and threaten the Soviet Union. Бомба приближается к точке взрыва. Высота 4000 метров. Осталось 3 секунды. 2, 1, 0! Though the Soviet Union and its allies were testing plenty of nuclear weapons during the Cold War, with one of the most famous ones being the massive 50 megaton Tsar Bomba, which made the atom bombs of 1945 look like raindrops in a puddle, it was nothing in comparison to how many weapons of mass destruction the United States and its allies were constructing and testing. With the formation of NATO by the West to push the Eastern Bloc to war, the socialist camp of nations had to adapt to this and build up their defences, as they had officially been forced into the arms race. This is how mutually assured destruction came about, as in the 1960s in particular, the United States and the Soviet Union both had the nuclear capabilities to threaten the very existence of humanity. The premise of mutually assured destruction is as follows. Whoever presses the big red button to send those nukes flying will also be met with a retaliatory strike. Hence the reason why I made the comparison with you and your opponent living your lives with guns pointed at your heads. One side is armed to the teeth and the only saving grace is that you also have weapons pointed at them. So, MAD is definitely a suitable acronym, and one film that explores the grim reality of mutually assured destruction and tries to show how it would all play out if a nuclear war were to break out is a BBC docudrama from the 1980s, a film that remains the scariest film that I have ever seen. This film is called Threads. Threads is set in the city of Sheffield up in Yorkshire in the UK. The movie was released in 1984 and is set in the mid-1980s when tensions between NATO and the Warsaw Pact were actually at breaking point. Now, in comparison to the Hollywood production The Day After, which was released in the United States a year before in 1983, though The Day After had better effects and a higher budget, during the production of Threads, many experts, which included defence specialists, physicians and psychologists were all involved and had a great level of input in writing and producing this film. This is what made Threads by far the most realistic depiction of a nuclear war. The United States government has been forced, reluctantly, to take action to safeguard what it believes are legitimate Western interests in the Middle East. The story of Threads kicks off with the United States trying to meddle and start a coup in Iran, but the Soviet Union steps in and decides to defend Iran from US hegemony. In the midst of all of this, tensions between NATO and the Warsaw Pact get even worse, as there are a number of confrontations between the US and the Red Army troops in Iran, followed by nuclear explosions in the Middle East. These nuclear exchanges then escalate between the two superpowers, at which point mutually assured destruction goes into effect, and RAF Finningly, which was a key strategic base during the Cold War that was just 15 to 20 miles away from Sheffield, gets nuked, completely transforming the great city of Sheffield into a post-apocalyptic wasteland. Come on! 
Despite this storyline, however, Threads is not an overly political film. Apart from showing snippets of news reports of all of the confrontations between the US and the Soviet forces, the geopolitical reasons for the outbreak of the nuclear war are barely touched upon. Instead, the film is written from the perspective of the common person, who is really just hoping for the best and trying to push the information of what's going on to the back of their minds. And unlike most other movies, the film also jumps from character to character, which makes you identify with some while seeing others as your loved ones. Though the attack scene itself would be the perfect climax for any feature film, because of all of the chaos and the panic that unfolds, with threads, that's just where we're getting started, as the rest of the film, after the initial blast over Sheffield, shows the long and terrible road that survivors have to go through to try and rebuild society to what it once was. And though this movie's budget was nowhere near as high as other Hollywood depictions of nuclear warfare, it's needless to say that Threads definitely doesn't hold back with its shock factor, and leaves you completely hopeless, since it combats all of those delusional thoughts in your mind that everything somehow gonna be okay. You see radiation sickness, awfully realistic corpses, mothers holding the fried bodies of their dead babies, deformed and mentally impaired teenagers who haven't had any means to learn any proper language, literally raping each other. You see the last remnants of the government becoming extremely tyrannical, with police officers and soldiers shooting those foraging for food. You see hospitals with no more modern medicine, jam-packed with injured and desperate people. The list goes on. Hanging in the atmosphere, the clouds of debris shut out the sun's heat and light. Across large areas of the northern hemisphere, it starts to get dark. It starts to get cold. In the centers of large land masses like America or Russia, the temperature drop may be severe, as much as 25 degrees centigrade. Even in Britain, within days of the attack, it could fall to freezing or below for long, dark periods. Threads is widely known as the movie that terrified a generation, and I can definitely see why. This film was even part of the school curriculum in Britain back in the 1980s, and I can just imagine that those who saw it at 13 or 14 years old were left a bit messed up afterwards, especially as the main focus and the message of the film is showing the audience the complete unravelling of society. Though we can be thankful that threads remained on the television screens, there were stages during the Cold War when what people saw on their screens in 1984 on the BBC became terrifyingly close to actually becoming a reality. With the Soviet Union and its allies being forced into the arms race by the capitalist powers who had entered the age of nuclear weapons, the very existence of mankind was being threatened, and an example of a point during the Cold War when humanity came frighteningly close to its own extermination by nuclear warfare was the Cuban Missile Crisis. Located just a few miles off the coast of Florida, the Caribbean island nation of Cuba was where the conflicts and tensions between the capitalist West and the socialist East definitely almost reached a destructive climax. Once a millionaire's playground that was full of casinos and plantations owned by giant companies, Cuba was a colony of the United States, a colony that was managed by the brutal dictator Fulgencio Batista. This, however, would soon be changed in 1959, when Cuba finally gained its independence from US hegemony as a result of the very popular communist revolution that overthrew Batista's repressive regime, a revolution that was conducted by communist guerrillas under the leadership of Fidel Castro and the Argentinian revolutionary Ernesto Che Guevara. The revolution sent the landlords and the casino capitalists running, and it brought great change and a massive improvement to the living standards of Cubans with the introduction of universal housing, healthcare and education. 
including the introduction of equal rights for many ethnic groups within the country. Cuba also began granting political asylum to those who were fleeing from racism in the United States, and they started handing support to anti-imperialist forces in many countries across the globe. The road to Havana, paved with glory for rebel chieftain Fidel Castro, 32-year-old man of the hour in Cuba. His army of irregulars have taken over an island of six and a half million. And now, news of the day brings to your screen the voice of Senor Castro, non-practicing lawyer, revolutionist by profession, who has often said, I am fighting for a democratic Cuba and an end to dictatorship. But almost immediately after the revolution, the United States started placing embargoes onto the new socialist state to try and sabotage their economy, a problem which Cuba still finds itself suffering with today. And in 1961, the US forces even attempted a full-scale invasion of the Bay of Pigs, an invasion which was heroically fought off by the Cuban people. All of the threats and the attacks that Cuba continued to receive from the United States was what led to them very quickly establishing close economic and political ties with the Soviet Union. The United States had missiles placed in Turkey and Italy that were aimed at the USSR and its allies in Eastern Europe. And because of this, a secret meeting was held between Cuban leader Fidel Castro and Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev, in which both of them agreed that nuclear missiles should be placed onto Cuba as a warning to the US to not get too big for their boots. Good evening, my fellow citizens. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. The intelligence services in the US were totally oblivious to this for a considerable amount of time, but soon enough a flight mission over Cuba discovered that platforms for ballistic missiles had already been established and materials for the missiles were ready to go through the phase of construction. Very shortly afterwards, US President John F. Kennedy brought an executive committee together to analyze the intelligence that had been gathered from this flight mission, with many of the officials trying to push for a second full-scale US invasion of Cuba. But although Kennedy initially disagreed with a US invasion of Cuba, he rolled over to putting forward a plan to blockade all Soviet transport that was coming into Cuba, which was basically an act of war anyway. This did not take many boxes for Soviet leaders at all, and Nikita Khrushchev himself actually wrote to the US president in response to this, in which he stated, quote, The violation of freedom to use international waters and international airspace is an act of aggression which pushes mankind toward the abyss of a world nuclear missile war, close quote. Things quickly turned from bad to worse, as the US military had set itself to DEFCON 2 for the very first time. DEFCON 2 being the level of defence preparation that gets put in place just before the outbreak of a nuclear war. But despite all of the diplomatic efforts from both the United States and the Soviet Union to try and find a resolution for this crisis, as well as the fact that both the Soviet Union and Cuba clearly insisted that the missiles that they had on the island were for defence purposes only, the US was just not having any of it. Therefore, Nikita Khrushchev actually sent an offer to John F. Kennedy on October the 26th, 1962. This offer stated that the Soviet missiles that were stationed in Cuba would be removed, but only if the United States removed their blockade on the country, showed that they wouldn't try to invade the country, and also only if the US missiles stationed on Italy and Turkey were removed as well. Now this offer of Khrushchev's looked as though it would pave the way for the end of the Cuban Missile Crisis altogether, but unfortunately, literally on the same day, a US spy plane was shot down over Cuba by a Soviet surface-to-air missile. This made finding a resolution to the crisis more and more difficult, as Kennedy then ignored Khrushchev's request for the removal of US missiles from Italy and Turkey, and he suggested that the United Nations should supervise the removal of Soviet missiles from Cuba, but with a guarantee that the United States would not try to invade the country. 
But just when you think that things couldn't get any worse, another close call occurred on the 27th of October of 1962, in which a senior officer in the Soviet Navy named Vasily Arkhipov managed to avert the outbreak of a nuclear war. Vasily Arkhipov was the commander of the B-59 submarine, which on the fateful day of the 27th of October 1962 was not very far away from Cuba when all hell very nearly broke loose. Upon detecting the Soviet submarine, the US forces began dropping non-lethal depth charges around the vessel to encourage the crew to surface. The crew inside the submarine, however, were very unaware of this, and they initially believed that they were witnessing the beginning of a war. At the same time, the US forces who were dropping the depth charges were also completely unaware that this particular submarine was actually armed with a 10 kiloton nuclear torpedo, and that the officers on board the vessel did not need permission from Moscow to launch it. Instead, in order for the torpedo to be launched, all senior officers who were present had to agree unanimously before taking action, and out of the three senior naval officers on board of this submarine, Vasily Arkhipov was the only one who disagreed. After calming the other officers down, the nuclear torpedo was thankfully never launched. In the midst of all of this chaos, a top secret meeting took place between US politician Robert Kennedy and Soviet ambassador to the United States, Anatoly Dobrynin. The summit between them led to an agreement that the US missiles would be removed from Italy and Turkey in the several months after the end of the Cuban Missile Crisis. This information was very quickly sent back to Moscow by Dobrynin, who urged for the acceptance of this resolution. And so, on the 28th of October 1962, Nikita Khrushchev released a statement that ordered for the removal of all Soviet missiles from Cuba. And several months later, the US followed suit by removing their missiles from Italy and Turkey. It was the acts of diplomacy between the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 that managed to prevent the concept of mutually assured destruction from being materialized. Here are the warning sounds again. Attack! Alongside the close calls of the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, the early 1980s was another stage during the Cold War that was pretty intense, to the point where there were drills in school classrooms and even government-funded adverts on television and on the radio to prepare people for the outbreak of a nuclear war. Though mutually assured destruction was very narrowly prevented from actually taking effect by acts of diplomacy during tense stages during the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, a very close call did occur in 1983, which was thankfully stopped by somebody who just happened to be in the right place at the right time. This person, who is widely regarded as the man who saved the world, was a lieutenant colonel in the Soviet Air Defense Forces named Stanislav Petrov. As the duty officer at the secret command center called Serpukov 15, which was just outside of Moscow, and the purpose of Serpukov 15, like all other command centers that were dotted around the USSR, was to help the Soviet forces monitor their early warning satellites that were orbiting over the United States. Stanislav Petrov was just a few hours into his shift, and it was a shift like any other normal shift at the command center he was stationed in. But this would all change on the fateful day of the 26th of September 1983, when all of the alarms actually went off, causing widespread panic in the command center. The computers blared out a warning that five intercontinental ballistic missiles had all been launched towards the Soviet Union from an American base. And to make matters worse, Stanislav Petrov's position as an officer at the command center meant that he was at the very center of deciding what to do next, while also being responsible for reporting what was happening to the general staff of the Red Army, who would then consult with the Soviet leader Yuri Andropov himself on launching a retaliatory strike against the United States. 
so everything could have quite easily gone very pear-shaped very quickly. But as Petrov was holding a telephone in one hand to report what was happening to his superiors and an intercom in the other hand to give the team he was supervising in the command centre instructions of what to do next, all while watching everything unfolding like a hawk and trying his best just to absorb any information that he could, he miraculously trusted his gut instinct that this was a false alarm and that it was just the computer playing up. So, he ultimately made the big decision not to press the big red button. Now it's absolutely terrifying to think of what could have happened if Stanislav Petrov wasn't called in for a shift on that day in 1983. To think if somebody with a lesser judgement being responsible for authorising a launch was to make a terrible mistake, or even if Petrov himself was to be having a bit of a rough day that affected his judgement of the situation unfolding in front of him, then it's safe to say that the consequences would have been very grim. With mutually assured destruction added to the mix, it just goes to show that the Cold War was definitely a pretty scary time for not just the people in the West, but also for the people of the Socialist Bloc, especially when you take into account that it was the United States and NATO who intended to initiate such a destructive war against the Eastern Bloc. A war which would well and truly send us back to the Stone Age, because, quite frankly, nobody can win a nuclear war. And as much as the US government might disagree with this statement, the fact remains that the results of such a conflict would wipe out practically all complex life forms on Earth, and transform beautiful landscapes and biomes into nothing but barren and radioactive wastelands. This is also why I'm a very firm supporter of nuclear disarmament, and after having plenty of discussions with other communists about the subject of WMDs, my position on the matter of nuclear disarmament is that it should be totally and entirely non-discriminant. The reason why I hold such a position is because what I notice the big capitalist countries like the US doing, for instance, is actually preventing other countries who are victims of sanctions and attacks from having these weapons of mass destruction as a deterrent to being invaded and massacred. Meanwhile, countries like the United States, who start so many wars for domination and overthrow so many democratically elected governments to enable big companies to steal resources, are stockpiling on their own arsenals of nuclear weapons. Even as recently as earlier this year, the aggressive AUKUS deal between Australia, the US and the UK was passed at the command of the White House and the Pentagon, and the intention of this deal to build more nuclear submarines for Australia is just to try and exert domination over Southeast Asia, while blatantly attempting to force China into an arms race, just as the West did with the Soviet Union during the Cold War. This act of plain hypocrisy by the capitalist powers really does put me in favour of countries such as the DPRK, who stand against imperialism for their sovereignty and bear in mind that they are also being lectured by the Japanese who once ruled over Korea with an iron fist about so-called human rights. Countries like that which are fighting against the empire of capital in my view, have the full right to obtain weapons of mass destruction in these current conditions, since they act as a huge deterrent to them being attacked. And this view of mine can also be applied to the days of the Cold War, as the socialist bloc being threatened on all fronts by NATO meant that for the Soviet Union and the people's democracies of Eastern Europe, putting up defences was absolutely necessary. This is why nuclear disarmament should be entirely non-discriminant. But since war is a very profitable business under capitalism, all I can say is that from my position here in the heart of the capitalist world, I sadly can't see nuclear disarmament happening anytime soon.
This is why the only way to actually go about facilitating it would be to build a huge resistance against imperialism at home, to not only weaken the establishment here, but to also show solidarity to the victims of Western hegemony abroad. And this resistance should be followed by a complete restructure of society as we know it, so basically a revolution. And as Lenin said, quote, Our aim is to achieve a socialist system of society which, by eliminating the division of mankind into classes, by eliminating all exploitation of man by man and nation by nation, will inevitably eliminate the very possibility of war." Close quote. It was this ultimate goal that the socialist countries of the 20th century were working to achieve, that goal being the inevitable transition from capitalism to communism.